Well, good morning, 1115 service. I'll try to get you home by halftime so you can watch the Packers lose, okay? Oh. Oh. All right. Yeah. Go home. I'm just, I'm just kidding. No, we need you for the end of the service. I know. It's not permission. It's just anger coming out. It's all right. Um, <laughs> I can tell you something. I have a friend of mine that came up from Fresno, and he, he's not particularly affectionate about certain teams that people love around here. So he said, Scott, you know what? You know what you call 53 millionaires that gather to watch all of the semifinals and then the Super Bowl? You know what you call them? You call them the San Francisco 49ers. That was so low. You, I, they might even still be here in the service, so we, we have to feel the love for them, but it's probably not a lot of love. Okay. Oh, hey, let me give you a few good pieces of news. This week, for example, my seventh grandchild was born on Monday. <laughs> Little Juliana arrived. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, I had a chance to sit there and talk with her, and her English is actually pretty good for being brand new. And she's number seven for us. I can't believe we gave our kids permission to procreate but we got a bunch of them. Also, I want you to know that back last year, you know, we did this Double Our Impact campaign where we were trying to raise money to pay off a debt. Well, we paid like 355,000 towards the debt. Well, this week, we made another payment based on money that came in of $400,000 towards killing our debt. So let's just smash that thing down. We're over half the way there. And if everybody gives according to pledges, we will have raised like a million dollars. And, and, and as I was thinking about that, somebody actually, this is amazing, someone put a million dollar bill in the offering plate. <laughs> Kid you not. Stay with me now. <laughs> I got all excited. I thought, the campaign's over. We raised a million, there's another million there. So we rushed off to the bank and I had a silly grin on my face until the bank and said, sorry, Mr. Hanson, that's a forgery. It's a so I just want you to know, I have a million dollar bill here for sale for $100,000 this morning, and all proceeds go to the Double R Impact campaign, okay? First person to ask gets it, okay? So anyways, we're, we're making good progress. It feels good to pay a debt off. It's nice to be free. So we're over halfway there, so praise the Lord. Okay, well last week we started a sermon series about discipleship, about a pathway, <coughs> excuse me, a pathway to discipleship. And this morning we're going to continue that. We talked about connecting last week. I just want to remind those of you that might be new to this series that Jesus Christ makes some pretty colossal statements about wanting to draw all of us into discipleship, to become disciples, and then to make disciples. And part one is that we first of all believe Him, and then we submit to Him, and then we follow Him, even when where He leads us may not be entirely comfortable, because that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And, and last week, oh, well, what, what we did was, <coughs> I'm sorry, I've got something tickling. Last week, we identified four areas of personal development that have been pretty common among believers for the last 20 centuries of church history. And these are areas where they may not fit perfectly as far as a linear lineup and all that, but these are just areas where believers consistently grow if they're going to become mature in Christ. And we call them Connect, grow, serve, and reach. You see the emblems behind us? They're up on there. I want everybody to say these four words with me. Are you ready? Connect, grow, serve, and reach. <coughs> now, last week we covered connect. And when we say connect, what we mean is we first of all make a connection with God through faith in Christ, followed by believers' baptism. We take the step of sealing that commitment by testifying to the world we belong to Christ, okay? It's really two steps, but I'm going to kind of call it one step. Solid connection with God. Then the next thing we talked about was connection with the local church. Jesus said, I'll build my church. And so he didn't want to leave us as orphans. And so we talk about making a vital connection with the local church. And that we do that here at FBC through our membership class. And I just have to say, last week we did a lot of really cool connecting. Now, before you clap, listen. Seven people put their trust in Christ for the first time. 28 people agreed to be baptized. And 80 people agreed to become members of this church or go to our membership class. So I was pretty happy about all the connecting going on. <coughs> well, this week, I'm sorry, boy, I'll get it out. I'll just keep drinking. This week, we're not going to talk about connecting anymore. We're going to talk about growing. I'm going to take a risk here. And my risk is I'm going to assume that everybody has already made a connection with God through faith in Christ. That's a bad assumption 
Because there's some here, you've not done that. And I'm also going to assume that you've made the step of obedience in believer's baptism after conversion. And there's some of you that haven't done that. And then I'm also going to assume that you've actually been through our membership program and you said, I'm not going to be on the periphery as a spectator anymore. I want to get in on the mission that Jesus has given this church. And I'm all in. And you've become a member. Okay? But the reason I want to assume that is because I want to talk to you about if you've done those three things, what's the next step in the pathway to discipleship? And the answer is, the next step has to do with growing. Okay? Now, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Okay? If you brought your dangerous book, that's where we're going. Ephesians chapter 4. <coughs> While you're going there, I want to say that once a new tree is planted, once a new baby is born, we just kind of assume they're going to grow, right? By nature, they grow. Well, we're actually told the purpose of the church church meaning all of us and each of us here in Ephesians 11 and all of these words connect, grow, serve, reach in some translation actually come from this text so let me read it to you okay in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 the apostle Paul says it was he God who gave some to be apostles that would be like Paul Peter some to be prophets some to be evangelists and some to be pastors and teachers these are like catalytic leadership gifts and he gives them to the church for what purpose? Here's the purpose. To prepare God's people for works of service. There's your serve, okay? So that the body of Christ may be built up. That assumes growth. Until we all reach, there's reach, <coughs> unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So our goal is to become like Christ. We said that last week too. Then we'll no longer be like infants tossed back and forth by the winds or the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and the cunning craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. He's basically saying that as we grow up and we mature, we become more stable. We're not as vulnerable. We're not as easily knocked down by the stuff that's going on in the world around us that's anti-God. We're stable. And then in verse 15, it says, and it mentions grow here, instead, speaking the truth of love, in love, we will in all things, what's the next word? grow. We will in all things grow. I'm going to put that up on the screen too. Speaking the truth in love, we will grow uh, to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. And then verse 15 he says it again. Instead, um, verse 16, <laughs> from him Christ, the whole body and the word could be connected here or joined, held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Peter wrote two epistles in the, in the New Testament. And the last epistle is called Second Peter, duh. And the last chapter is chapter 3. And the last verse is this. He leaves us with this command in Peter. Is it his last words? Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Grow. Grow. We are to connect and then we are to grow. You need to grow. I need to grow. It's not optional, and we can't stand still in our spiritual progress either. In fact, people that think they're standing still in their spiritual walk with God are probably moving backwards. Because it's an uphill climb, folks. And when you stand still, you slide backwards. So let's talk a little bit about that. Let me give you a few principles and observations about growth. Okay? Number one, principle number one. In some respects, spiritual growth is similar to physical growth. Uh, for example, you feed and care for a little child after its birth and it's going to tend to grow in a fairly predictable manner. Then the two biggest factors for growth in a small child is food and family, right? Same thing, as a, same thing in spiritual growth. If you give people food, the Word of God, family, the church, in the right healthy context, they're going to tend to grow. Okay? So there is a certain corollary between spiritual growth and, and, uh, and physical growth, but it breaks down after a while. So principle number two is, is that there are ways in which spiritual growth is dissimilar to physical growth. Let me explain. And this might help you understand spiritual growth. Have you ever noticed that the human body goes to a certain point in its physical development and then begins to decline? I'm not at my peak yet, but I'm probably, okay, okay, I was there. All right. You don't have to laugh, okay? It's okay. We get to a certain point, and then our bodies actually start losing muscle tone. My grandmother was like two inches shorter when she died than she was when she was 60. 
How does that happen? That's just funky. So physical growth kind of takes a trajectory like this and then goes like this. Now, that's not the way spiritual growth works. The Bible tells us that you can actually grow and be spiritually renewed every day of your life right up to the point where you die and then you can continue into the next life continuing to grow. That's why it's different than physical growth. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 16. If there's any of you that doubt this fact that physical development has an apex and then you begin to decline, look around at the people that have furniture disease around you where their chest is dropped into their drawers. Okay, it just happens, right? <laughs> but not with spiritual growth. Spiritual growth can be maintained, if we want to, all of our life without interruption. We're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I'll put the reference there, um, it says, Therefore we do not lose heart, and these are the words I want you to notice. Though outwardly we are wasting away. That's the physical peak that we hit, followed by decline. Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Now I think it's really good news, and I hope you do too, that you can grow throughout your entire eternity with God if you want to. And there's never a time when you have to do this. Never. I mean, you could choose if you want to do that, but you don't ever have to do that. Unlike physical growth, you can continue throughout your entire lifetime and into, the, into beyond eternity and growth. But here's, here's, here's an important thing for you to also understand about growth. Spiritual growth never happens by accident. You have to want it. You have to pursue it. It never occurs. You don't ever wake up saying, wow, today I feel more patient than yesterday. It doesn't happen that way. Without developing strong Christian relationships and healthy habits that we regularly practice, there's a little chance that you and I are going to grow spiritually. Let me, let me uh, illustrate this just a bit. <laughs> I've been a Christian now since 1978, and I can tell you I have never, and I mean never, met a mature Christian that didn't have a healthy habit in reading their Bibles and didn't have a healthy habit in connecting significantly with other Christians in one another community. Never met a person that, that could, could glance off, the, never met an exception to that. And so if we think we're going to be the exceptions and we can just bypass Jesus' pathway to discipleship, I think we have 20 years of century that would remind us that we can't. And that's why it's important that we figure out what it means to grow. You have to want to grow and you have to take concrete steps to grow. You need to make a plan to grow. Growth is very intentional. Never happens by accident. Principle number four this morning. You cannot make yourself grow, but you can create the environment in your life in which growth can occur. You probably think, well, I thought you just told me we had to grow, and now you say I can't make myself grow. Well, let me explain. If you ever talk to a farmer uh, and a farmer says, I grow this or I grow that. That's not literally true because nobody grows anything. God grows things. Human beings don't grow things. Have you ever seen the miracle of the seed where you plant a seed, you bury it, put water on it, the sun strikes it, and then the miracle is all of a sudden, boop, it resurrections, takes life, and it germinates and becomes a plant. Who does that? Do you do that? Does a farmer do that? God does that. Turn backwards one more book to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And this is what we read. Paul was talking to this church that he had been involved in planting. <coughs> Excuse me. In Corinth. And this is what he says. I planted the seed. Chapter 3 verse 6. Apollos watered it. But God has, God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants. Nor the one who waters is anything. But only God who makes it grow. Or makes things grow. So only God makes things grow. Everybody say that with me. Only God makes things grow. But that doesn't let you and me off the hook. Because we need to cooperate with this growth-giving God so that growth occurs in our life. All right? Um, God has given us a, a, a number of resources, like His Holy Spirit, like the Bible, like other Christians. He's given us a number of resources through which if we utilize them as he gave them to us, what we do is we kind of prepare the soil so that it's like a greenhouse environment where growth, spiritual growth, is most likely to occur, okay? That's why generally people will grow spiritually more in a church than in a bar, 
Okay, do you understand the difference? Are you with me, church? Okay? All right, now. Um, I'm going to talk to you about these areas of growth, these, these, these ways that God has given us, means, measures, disciplines. But before I do that, I want to give you the two big categories where God would like to see growth in our life. And for that, we need to go to the Gospel of Mark, chapter, uh, let's go to chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. Somebody was listening to Jesus one day, pretty impressed with his answers, walks up to him and asks him a big question about the commandments of God. You need to know in the context of this passage that if the Jews are counting correctly, I read one rabbi that said there are 613 laws in the Old Testament. And somebody one day asked, one day asked Jesus, yeah, but what's the most important one? So that's what he says in chapter 12, verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Newsflash. He asks for one commandment. Jesus gives him two. So obviously these two are pretty important, okay? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's the famous Shema confession concerning the unity of God. Here's the commandment, the first commandment he gives. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. That's pretty much everything, right? Your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That pretty much wraps up. It's basically you give everything you are to everything God is, right? That's commandment number one. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he goes on to say, there is no commandment greater than these. They asked him for one. He gave them two when they asked what are the greatest. So I can tell you with the full authority of the Lord Jesus Christ that the main areas where God wants you to develop spiritually in growth is with your relationship with him vertically and with your relationship with other people horizontally. Okay? That's what, that's what he's actually saying. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about vertical growth where you dig down deep with your roots into God and you grow vertically with your relationship with him and then horizontally where you actually invest in significant relationships with other people, particularly in this case, believers, and you develop horizontally in your love relationships as well. God is asking every one of us to develop in these two areas. Are you with me, church? Okay, it's important. I'm trying to be simple here. So let's talk about vertical growth. And again, I'm not going to tell you some new stuff this morning you've never heard before, probably, because this is not a question of the mind. It's a question of what we do. It's a question of what we're willing to put into regular practice in our life. But since we're at the beginning of the new year, I'm going to ask every one of us to take full responsibility to cooperate with God, to grow in our relationship with God this year. You want 2015 to be a good year? Let's not just be a great year of growth. Principle number five regarding vertical growth. Vertical growth with God requires integrating healthy habits into your life. Vertical growth with God requires integrating healthy habits into your life. These are things that you choose to do, and they're things that you choose to do repeatedly. Healthy habits that become a part of your routine. So, I'm going to give you the first two, because I think they're the biggest two, okay? And they are Bible and prayer. See, I told you you weren't going to hear anything that you hadn't heard before, okay? This isn't new news, right? But I'm going to maybe unpack this just a little different. God says, you want to grow in 2015 in your relationship with me? Eat the word and breathe conversationally in prayer with me. That's what I want you to do. So let's talk about eating the word of God. Okay, I told you, I told you this week that I went down to Fresno and met my brand new granddaughter, Juliet, a cutie tootie, all right? And you know what was amazing to me? Just like all the other seven grandkids or six grandkids I have, she was born a sucker. She craved her mom's milk from the second she was born. Because God put it in her to do that. And what's interesting is 1 Peter picks up on that analogy in chapter 2. And it says, like newborn babes, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Milk is a metaphor for the Bible. Like spiritual newborn babies, crave the milk of God. Watch my little granddaughter. From day one, she longs the nourishment of her mother from the milk that, that only my daughter can provide her with. 
And this is something God hardwires people to want naturally. And now God is saying, spiritually, I want you to be that hungry for my word. I want you to want it that bad. And why is that such a big deal? I'll tell you why. If you try to run your life on your own without the input of God's word, you basically are going to end up imitating the people around you. Have you ever noticed that it's real easy to imitate the culture we live in and just kind of go with the flow? Have you ever noticed that? You guys are real quiet today. Are you like 49er fans or something? You're just like, you're in grief or something? You need counseling? I don't remember what I was saying, but it was fun. <laughs> Until I was converted at the age of 18, I just imitated everybody around me. I just basically did whatever they did. But that's not what God wants us to do. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Stop imitating the people around you. They don't know me, so don't use them as your examples and heroes. It says, don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, the thinking of this world. Rather, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's, the word is metamorphosized, like a butterfly, right? From a caterpillar to a butterfly. Be renewed in your mind. How do you get your mind renewed, church? You get your mind renewed with truth. And where does truth come? Jesus said, "My thy word is truth. You get it from the word of God. Then you'll be able to discern what the good and pleasing will of God is. That's, that's what it says in Romans 12 too. So to counterbalance the influence of the world, we, we eat the word and the word keeps us on course in our pathway to discipleship, even though the voices around us would try to knock us off of that. Now let me try to be practical about this. What does it mean to eat the word? That sounds so spiritual, doesn't it? Well, let me, let me, let me just try to roll it out the way it, I do it in my life. <coughs> there is listening to the word. There is reading the word. There is studying the word. There is memorizing scripture. And there's meditation. It's actually five things that I do. Step one, listen to the word. How many of you have a version app on your iPhones? On your phones? Okay. Uh, if you don't, oh, if you do, by the way, you can actually go into that, and it will actually read the Bible to you. It's pretty cool. So some mornings when I don't quite want to get up and it's a little cold, I just put my, my phone on the pillow next to me, and I actually listen to Scripture. I listen to Scripture. Then the next step would be to actually read it while you're listening to it or just read it, because there's something about taking the Bible in through the portals of your eyes that receives it a little deeper into your soul. So I listen to the Word, I will read the word, but you're not done yet because the Bible says study to show yourself approved. So you study the Bible. Now, how do you study the Bible? It's more than reading. To study something, you have to slow down. And you have to make observations about what you're reading. And you make little scribbled notes in the margin of your Bible. You check some cross-references. For me, I actually like to actually write Scripture out with my hand or type it into my computer because it just internalizes a little bit more, okay? So I've gone from listening, to reading, to studying, and then the next big step is to commit to memory something in the scriptures. And you commit to memory various, and some people say, I can't memorize anything, baloney. We can all memorize stuff. And so you just commit scriptures to memory, and I'll tell you what, you can never meditate on something that you haven't put in here. And our goal is to get thy word have I hid in my heart, David says. So you get it into here by listening, reading, studying, and memorizing. And then the final step is meditating where you think about it all throughout the day. He will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. That's Isaiah 23. I'm sitting there memorizing this in a hard position because I remember that God is my rock. He's my rock eternal. And so I just, I meditate on that, and it goes from here to here, and then starts leaking out in my words, and in my thoughts, and in my behavior. Do, do, do you follow that? It's just, it's, uh, you start with listening, you read, you study, you memorize, you meditate. Now I'm telling you, if you choose to do that in 2015, you're going to grow. You're going to grow in your love with God. You're going to grow in your knowledge of the truth. You're going to grow. So I'm going to walk away from that because we could do a whole series on Bible and how to get the most out of your Bible. We probably should. But let's talk about breathing conversationally in prayer with God now. Okay? Breathing conversationally. Just as eating is necessary for survival and growth, so is breathing. And as disciples of Christ, we have to learn to develop 
in the area of two-way communication with God. Now, one, one person said, uh, Lily, you remember Lily, Lily Tomlin? Some of you might remember, some of you might. She says, when you talk to God, it's called prayer. When he talks to you, it's called schizophrenia. <laughs> okay, that's not true. That's not true. Two-way communication with God is where you actually learn how to talk with God, but you actually learn to listen from God too, and he whispers things to you. And this might be brand new for some of you going, what is this guy talking about? Well, let me just say, I too was once a brand new Christian, and I was clueless about how to pray. I was clueless. So I looked at the Bible, some of the verses, I looked at some of the people around me, and eventually I started praying in, in private, just kind of between me and God in my mind. And then I actually started praying out loud, and then I actually pushed this frontier back and discovered, this is a huge continent to discover, this whole prayer thing. And when I talk about two-way conversational prayer with God, what I mean is to share things with God. Even when you're driving in the car, just talk with God. Tell Him about what's bothering, what you're afraid of, what you're worried about. Praise Him when something great is going on. Thank Him. Uh, tell Him that you noticed the rainbow and He's showing off and you're impressed. You know, uh, confess your sins. It's not like He doesn't know them anyways. Get clean, get clean before the Lord. And then, and then, shock of all shocks, shut up. And just listen. And I'm telling you, if you create enough silence in your life and listen, your God is going to whisper things to you. The Holy Spirit is still alive and well and still speaks to Christians today. And you should want that. I want that. So this is part of it. And, and, and so let me just kind of, let me, let me do a side note on worship here for just a second. Because when you think of Bible and prayer, you could get this all wrong, okay? Some people think they have the Bible so they can fill their head up with facts. That's not the reason God gave us the Bible. Some people think that God gave us prayer so that we could just get what we want. God's not a Santa Claus in the sky. That's not how prayer works. God gave us prayer and God gave us the Bible to usher us into his presence as the almighty God. <coughs> and when we go into there, we discover who we are. Puny, infinitesimal, fallen, loved dust. And how great and majestic and amazing God is. And I'm telling you, when you use the Bible and prayer like that, you become a worshiper. You become so impressed with God that you can't help but not worship God. And I think Jesus said that to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4 when they met at the well. He said, God is seeking worshipers. So growing in Christ, growing this year, well, here's one of those tests. You can tell if you're growing in your relationship with God if all of a sudden you just... You break out in a song from Monday to Saturday to God. Have you ever done that? Where you just start singing a song to God? You've never done that? I'm sorry. You should do that. that. Listen, if you ever see me driving, don't come anywhere near my car. I worship when I drive. Okay? I don't know what it is about holding a stereo wheel. It makes me want to worship God. So I pray, I sing, I say, ah, oh, I saw that God, that's amazing, you're showing up. You know, I'll just do stuff like that, I pray, sometimes I probably close my eyes, I'm sorry, I just would drive. <laughs> you shouldn't be anywhere near my car, because my car is a vehicle of worship. And I, I'm telling you when, you, when you worship God throughout the week, that's a sign that you're growing in your relationship with God. Because God doesn't want to create people with Bible facts and people that turn the mechanism of prayer. God wants people to seek his face and know him and be very impressed with him. And so I hope that happens in your life. Now, what I want to do is I want to go a little bit beyond Bible study and prayer to talk about some other healthy habits that people have been practicing for centuries to grow deeper and to grow taller in their relationship with God. Okay? But before I do, let me offer a disclaimer. Don't try this at home unless you first are... are, are a good distance down the road with Bible study and prayer. Okay? Because I think the number one, number one thing that causes spiritual growth is the Bible, and the number two is developing conversational prayer. These are other means or healthy habits by which people have been growing in God for centuries. I know it's really small writing. Someday we'll buy bigger screens, but let me just read these to you, okay? Fasting. Skipping food or drink for a day or three or a week or something. You're just basically saying, God, you're more important than food. Sometimes people do this in the times of crisis. Sometimes they do it for cleansing. Sometimes they do it for clarity and guidance. But fasting. Silence. Times of solitude when you just get the noise out of your life so God can get through. 
Secret acts of service. This is when people will not know something kind you've done for them so that only you and God know it. Have you ever noticed that we like to do things that are kind of cool that people notice? But try doing them when you know nobody will ever notice them. And then all of a sudden, your motives are really purified. Another one is journaling. I've been journaling since 1987, my spiritual journey with God. Simplifying your lifestyle. Sacrificially giving. That's way beyond the tithe, by the way. Worship celebration. That's what I do in my car. Stay away from me. Confession. Sin. Listening prayer. Creative meditation. You're never going to find an end to God, so don't worry. He's bottomless. So just go for it. View it like exploring a continent, guys. Just go for it. Your God's a great God. Now, there are a certain number of books out on the market, and I put three of them in your, in your sermon outline. <coughs> Excuse me. Man. Uh, the Life You Always Wanted by John Orford. Dallas Willard's written a book called The Spirit of Disciplines. Richard Foster wrote a book called Celebration of Discipline. And let me just do a shameless promo here. Uh, last week you got this little booklet, uh, Growth Opportunities Catalog. You can get another one at Guest Services if you want. And in this catalog, we actually are teaching a couple of classes from the Foster book called Celebrate the Disciplines. And, and if you'd like to know more about these spiritual disciplines, hey, sign up for one of those classes. So let me, let me just talk a little bit more about that. These growth opportunity courses or core courses that we offer here in this winter quarter are specifically designed to help you grow taller or vertically in your relationship with God. And we have courses available that are starting right away. Uh, starting point, experiencing God, getting planted in God's family, growing strong in God's family, celebration of discipline, and you can register online. You can call Sharon Sorrentino in our office. You can go out and sign up at the Grow Expo before you leave today. But I just want you to know, we're making growth opportunities available for you. And let me say this so that you don't get the wrong impression. We want to collaborate with you as you collaborate with God. The healthiest, strongest Christians are self-feeders. All right? So what we want to do is we want to jumpstart that process and help you grow. But hopefully you can establish these habits and follow them on your own. So, enough said about that. Let me talk about horizontal growth now, or growth in our relationship with other people. Remember Jesus said, not just love God, but he also said, love your neighbor as yourself. Have you ever noticed how hard it is to love your neighbor? <laughs> Have you ever noticed how weird people are? <laughs> I mean, except you. You know, I used to think everybody was normal until I got to know them. And then people used to think I was normal until they got to know him. But this is a crazy thing. Jesus doesn't give anybody a pass in the church about growing horizontally in their relationships with other Christians. There's no Lone Ranger exception here. <coughs> you can try to do life alone like an island, but you're not going to grow spiritually. Jesus wants us to be connected relationally, practicing one another Christianity with other believers, connected in meaningful friendships with other believers. If you want to be a serious Christ follower, walking down the pathway that he's determined of discipleship, it will be in significant relational connection with other people. Okay? Got, a, got an email uh, last week from a couple, uh, and they said, Dear Pastor Scott, we like this about the church, we like this about the church, thank you for that, thanks for calling my wife, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but then he said, but we did go to one class with about 80 people, and not a person greeted us. And I just cringe when I hear that. Because, I don't know if you notice this, you can have a friendly church without a lot of friends. Uh, have you ever noticed the wave of greeters that we have here? Uh, we try to avalanche you with greeters around here. So, if you can somehow get in here, this room, without being greeted, you're like Houdini. Okay? Because we just want you to feel welcome. But it's different going from friendly to friendship. Because for me, a person that would attend this church month after month and never make a meaningful friendship, that's just sad. Because Jesus wants you to be connected with other believers. So principle, well, before I do principle, I want you to know that in the New Testament there are about 40 commandments about one another Christianity. In other words, 40 different commands of things we are to practice with each other as believers. And so I put that there. You've got it memorized? Okay, I'm taking it off. Okay, no. <laughs> you can't read that. Maybe you can. If you can, you have great eyesight. But let me just read that really fast, okay? 
Love one another, serve one another, honor one another, be devoted to one another, live in harmony with one another, accept one another, greet one another, encourage one another, be kind to one another, be compassionate with one another, <gasps> bear one another's burdens, speak the truth with one another, submit to one another, teach one another, admonish one another, forgive one another, spur one another on towards love and good deeds, do not judge one another, do not slander one another, do not grumble against one another. Woo! That's a lot of commands. Okay, I didn't even do them all. I just did the ones I could find. Okay, now I want you to think about this. Look at that you can't do that list unless you have Christian friends. Okay, for example, encourage one another. You wake up, you've been doing Christianity alone, you don't have friends. How are you going to encourage someone else? Spur one another on towards love and good deeds. How are you going to do that alone? Greet one another. I guess you could greet yourself in the mirror. But guys, the, the, okay, here's principle number six. Because you cannot practice one another community as it's designed unless you are in growing relationships with other believers. You can't do it. Jesus wants you to be connected with his other children. You have to be open in your life for friends and outside input. And you need to do life with others. And you need, you know, here's the crazy thing. We're all kind of like porcupines in the wintertime wanting to get warm. Do you know how a porcupine gets warm in the wintertime? Very carefully. You get the point? The point is, we're, oh, sorry, come on, third service. The first two services, they thought it was wonderful, and here you are just like groaning. What are you, 49er fans? Come on. <laughs> I'm going to get letters for that, too. Okay. All right. God wants you to be connected with other people. And I want you to know that we have ways that you can connect in relationship. We have women's and men's ministry. We have Bible study classes. We have all kinds of stuff. But I want to give you a heads up on where we're going. Because we are headed somewhere as a church. We do big well at this church. But we're going to get better at doing small. One year from now, we are going to have an established small group network of people where everybody that wants to have friends around here can have them. That's what we're going to do. We're going to start a small group ministry in the fall, and we're already doing some sneaky stuff behind the scenes. We're sending a group to a church that does it well this month. We're doing some pilot programs. What we're going to do is we're going to launch an all-church small group ministry in the autumn. And I already want to just put you on notice so you connect with that. So let me just tell you what that's going to be, okay? Yes, I think you should clap. Because... It's time, for us, it's time for us to practice one another Christianity at FBC. And not just a few of us, all of us. So when we think about this, the idea of small groups is rooted in God. God has existed from eternity past as a triune God. The Father, the Son, the Spirit. They have no beginning. So you've had a small group for eternity with God. And by the way, small groups were a reality of the early church as well. You go to Acts chapter 2. They were always meeting in each other's homes and eating together and taking communion together and meeting in subgroups and because they were too big always to meet together. So they always did these kind of small group meetings together. Small groups are for everybody who wants to move from being friendly to making friends. And I'll tell you, being friendly is okay. Making friends is way better. It's way better. So how are we going to do this at FBC? Thanks for asking. The future of small groups is that they're going to be sermon-based. So beginning next month, you are actually going to see questions. What we're going to do is we're just going to use the sermons on Sunday, whoever's preaching, and we're going to ask springboard questions for discussion in your small groups. And we're going to begin to bleed that in February. So everybody on the back of your sermon outline, you'll begin to see what it is that we're going to do in our small groups. Take away all the mystery, okay? Number two, future small groups will run on a quarter system, which means about 12 weeks from... September to early December, 12 weeks from mid-January to Easter, about 10, 12 weeks after Easter before the summer. And we're just going to take the summer off and breathe like a normal family, okay? So we're going to run them on a quarter system. They're going to be about 8 to 14 people meeting in homes throughout the city, throughout the week. We're going to have all kinds of them. And it'll be okay for you to try, try more than one group. There's sometimes when a person goes to a small group and they go, oh no, I'm stuck here for eternity and I don't like these people, okay? <laughs> We just want you to know, that's okay. They don't like you either. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just, I can't believe I said that. There are some times there's a chemistry issue and you need to try another small group. Now, if you're trying 15 different groups, the problem's probably you. But I just want you to know, it's okay to try 
different groups, okay? So that's not going to be a real problem. Uh, and I also want you to know, we actually have a limited number of small groups that are open and available if you want to join right now. And they're going to be piloting some of this experimentation we're going to do in the fall. Just go out to the Grow Expo. You can sign up. I know a bunch of people already signed up this morning. So if you'd like to do that, we've got a limited number of groups open if that's something you want to just jump into right now. Uh, let me kind of wrap all this up. And, and there is one thing that's kind of, I, I kind of said it, I kind of didn't say it when it comes to growing, okay? And it, I want to do a side note on giving. The leadership of this church, as we've grappled with this whole concept of discipleship, we keep coming back to the fact that a person that's growing, both vertically and horizontally, is going to be a person that's giving. They're going to be giving of their time. They're going to be giving of their talents. They're going to be giving of their, their treasure, even their finances. They're going to offer their home and cars and their resources to further the purposes of God. They're going to be a giving person, and I agree with that. I think that as we grow in Christ, I just understand, I come from a stingy family, and by nature I'm stingy. If I do anything generous, it's because of the work of God and His Spirit in my life, plus my wife pushing me to tip higher, okay? I just, I'm stingy by nature. But I want you to know that if you want to become like God, you need to become generous. You need to become giving. You know the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16? God so loved the, for God so loved the world that He took. Is that how it goes? God so loved the world that He gave. We've got a giving God. We want to become like our God, don't we? Isn't that the goal of discipleship? We come as, become as much like Jesus Christ as is humanly possible with the supernatural work of the Spirit in our life. So I just want to encourage you to learn to give. And let me just give you three reasons I think that people should give. I think the first reason is they should give to help others. Do you, do you realize we have a, an international network of missionaries that we support as a church? Do you know that we support a whole bunch of local organizations that do a lot of great and good for the community of Oak Grove? When you give, that's how it happens. Number two, we give to maintain a gospel witness in the Elk Grove area to the glory of Jesus Christ. FBC is a high-profile church, and if people want access to the gospel, this is how we do it. We maintain a strong Christian presence in this community, and when, that, when you give, that's what happens. But number three, and this is one you might not have seen coming, <coughs> we give so that we become generous. You become what you repeatedly do. So if you repeatedly give, guess what's going to happen eventually? You're going to become generous. If you keep and take and always receive, you're going to become stingy. But God wants you to be like him. It's not like God needs your money. You guys know that? Newsflash. God doesn't need your money. Okay? But when we give to the purposes of God, we grow. And Christ's honor grows. And so that's why he wants a growing disciple to, to give and to grow in the area of giving. Okay. Enough said God loves a cheerful giver. I will tell you this. In the month of December, there was a couple that came and gave a, a pretty large gift to our Double Our Impact campaign. And when they gave it, the wife went, Woohoo! And I thought, Are you okay? I said, Why'd you do that? Oh, I just felt like it. Yeah, but why'd you feel like it? She said, Well, God says He loves a cheerful giver, so I wanted to give it to you with cheer. I said, You are freaking amazing. I thought, this is one weird place, Elk Grove, but I kind of like that. You know? So next, when we give our offerings in just a few minutes, why don't you just go, woo-hoo. <laughs> whatever, okay, anyways, you know what I mean. So listen, here's, here's our goal and our desire. Our goal and our desire as leaders of FBC is that you would grow in 2015, that you grow vertically in your relationship with God, that you grow horizontally in your relationship with other believers. It's not going to happen by accident. Make a plan. Take some effort. Grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, discipleship means we trust Jesus. We follow Jesus. We submit to Jesus. And then we just keep walking down the pathway to discipleship. So take the next step. Whatever the Spirit of God is showing you is the next step. And we talked about the first two facets of this Connect, Grow, Serve Week. Last week, we talked about Connect. What's Connect? Whoa, 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 back that off. Okay. Connect first is to connect with God through faith in Christ and believer's baptism, right? So if you haven't done that, guess what your next step is? Next one would be that we connect with FBC through membership. We connect with a local body of believers. If you've not done that, hey, there's your next step. In growing, 
<coughs> we grow vertically in our relationship with God through establishing healthy habits like Bible, like prayer. If this is something you need to grow in, there's your next step. Or if you if you've grown in that, the next one would we connect horizontally in our relationships with others. We're going to do that in a lot of ways, but primarily through small groups here at FBC. Then in the fall, get in one of those small groups. See, what we want to do is we want this to be a greenhouse place where growth occurs and you become everything Jesus wanted you to become. So let's end with this um, an imagination thing. Let's imagine it's two years from now. And for a long time you've been working at this place and there's some people that just get under your skin and they provoke you and make you angry and sometimes you fling out some angry words. Sometimes you even say vulgarities. And they know you're a Christian, you feel bad about it, you tell God you're sorry, but you just keep doing it. That was two years ago. But two years have come and gone, and now it's different. You've been reading your Bible for about five minutes a day for the last couple of years. And you've been exploring conversational prayer with God, and all of a sudden you're realizing you're not reacting the way you used to act. You're acting intentionally and not leaning into the flesh, but into the Spirit. And all of a sudden all that Bible study and that time in prayer is paying off. Because now, when they step on you, stink doesn't come out. And you like the new you. Imagine two years from now, you're in your car, it's Wednesday, and you're driving to your small group, and you can't wait to be with your friends. When you first went there, you're going, oh, I don't know. But now you're there, and you can't wait to do life with them. You're going to open your Bibles, open your homes. You guys have a good dessert together, too. Mine, guys, at least, my group. And, and, and you're going to talk about life. You're going to... Pray for each other. If you have some really heavy things, you can share them because you trust these people. You hear them lifting you up to God in prayer, and you're going, why did I go so many years as a Christian without this? I was missing about half of Christianity. And you love the new you because you're growing vertically and you're growing horizontally. That's our desire for you. Grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Second Peter. 318. I'm going to call our ushers forward. We're going to receive our morning offerings and tithes. And we're going to close this service out in worship, church, okay? Let me pray. God, as I think about all this, I just want to thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit. And the Bible was a great idea, as was the church. And all of these other ways, God, you've given us to help us grow. We just want to thank you for that, that you didn't leave us like orphans, God. And so 2015, we want it to be a year of growth, Lord. So I pray that this time next year, we are taller spiritually, and we've grown horizontally as well by connecting with other people, connecting with you, growing with you, growing with others. That's what we want this year, God. In Jesus' name, amen.